Hello and welcome to this module entitled The Neurobiology of Major Depressive Disorder and Bipolar Disorder. I'm Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto. I'm head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit and also the Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation. The objectives of this module are to review the etiology of major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. We'll be taking what I would refer to as a transomic approach, starting with the genetic architecture and moving upward, if you will, to look at a variety of factors that we now believe are playing some type of etiologic role in individuals who in fact suffer from one of these two conditions. We'll spend much of the time discussing the brain substrates that are implicated as subserving, that is, are underlying the phenomenology of major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. During the last 10 years, there's been surreal advances that have been made in how we understand, or particularly the insights that we have on brain circuits, nodal systems, and networks that we believe are subserving the symptoms of this condition. First, I think I'd like to start off with more of a conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework that we work with today is that mood disorders, like many other mental or brain-based disorders, are disorders that are characterized by both neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative aspects. In other words, we know that a very large percentage of people who have mental illness or brain-based illnesses declare the mental disorder before the age of 25. In fact, 75% of all DSM-5 defined nosological entities or diagnostic entities are in fact declaring themselves observably before the age of 25, major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder being two of those conditions. We also know that for a significant subset or subpopulation of people who have major depression or bipolar disorder, the illness exhibits a course as well as treatment response pattern along with an underlying neurobiological change that is indicative of a dementing process. In other words, some type of toxicity, uh, another type of language that's been used is allostatic load, which is really the wear and tear on not just the brain, but the body occurs across time. So really, in fact, a confluence of de developmental and degenerative aspects are at play in individuals who have mood disorders. The very observation that there are, in fact, developmental and degenerative aspects uh, with both major depression and bipolar disorder has inspired the notion that perhaps for many individuals, we can categorize their illness according to staging. Across many areas of medicine, we stage disorders. And we know, for example, that diabetes or uh, hypertension, so the many forms of cancer are really described vis-a-vis -vis their stage of illness. And we know that many people who have major depression or bipolar disorder had risk that was apparent long before observable characteristics. And the illness manifests itself typically in late teenage years, 20s and 30s, uh, in individuals where initially the illness starts off with nonspecific symptoms or behavioral change, followed by declaration of the first episode of illness. That's then followed by recurrent illness, chronic illness, and functional deterioration. Although we don't actually have a empirically supported and consensually agreed upon staging system in major depression or bipolar disorder, there's a growing opinion that for a large percentage of our patients, staging would be indeed appropriate. Now the staging is not just an attempt to, if you will, stratify individuals or to find a way to uh, identify where they are at in the illness trajectory. It may also inform treatment selection. In other words, we now know that when you look at many pharmacological treatments, in both major depression and bipolar disorder, acute response seems to decrease as a function of episode frequency. In other words, people who've had a high number of prior episodes in both bipolar disorder as well as a major depressive disorder, on average, have lower rates of remission and full functional recovery. This speaks clearly to processes that are occurring that are clearly uh, mitigating against uh, optimal out outcomes in depression, but also reminds us how important it is to make timely, early, and accurate detection of both conditions. What's important to highlight is, is that the decreased responsiveness that is seen with treatments is not delimited to pharmacotherapy, 
We also see that with psychotherapy in individuals who've had multiple episodes of mood disorders. So we start off with a conceptual framework that we believe that in many people who have major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, there's a complex confluence of developmental as well as degenerative aspects that are occurring. That observation then provides the, the framework or the platform for now cascading down, zooming in, and trying to identify what are the substrates, what are the effector systems. In other words, what are the physiologic systems that are responsible not only for risk, but also for resiliency against the risk. We're reminded that psychopathology can be categorized across a finite number of domains or dimensions. Now we have hundreds of, of nosological entities that are defined and operationalized in DSM-5. And the DSM-5 remains a very important and very useful diagnostic tool. But as we look at mental or brain-based disorders agnostically, that is just look at psychopathology in general, the brain manifests psychopathology across, as I said, a finite number of domains. That being in general cognitive processes, uh, the domain of cognitive emotional processes, which includes uh, experiences of perceived or real threat. Also, aspects around reward, like reward valuation, reward response, reward learning. We also know many people have general cognitive problems or social cognitive problems, while other people have problems with fear or problems with circadian rhythms. So as we begin to think about what is the etiology of major depression or bipolar disorder, yes, it begins with a conceptual framework of development and degeneration. It also, in fact, has to include recognition of the fact that the ideological substrates are not unique to major depression or bipolar. They cut across many of the disorders throughout the, di the diagnostic enti entities we see throughout the developmental trajectory in psychiatry. And by taking a domain-based approach, we position ourselves to not only homogenize the phenotype, but we really position ourselves to, in fact, better understand what is the underlying brain substrate. So when we think about etiology, one way to think about etiology is through a multi-systems approach. In other words, beginning with genetics, then moving through molecules and cells, through circuits, through the networks, the observable, observable behavior, and then moving into such things as self-reports. What I'd like to do for today's module is I'd like to spend much of our time speaking about the molecular changes and certainly many of the cellular changes we see. We know that major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder are heritable. There is, in fact, a genetic liability to both conditions. For major depressive disorder, on average, the genetic liability is estimated at about 30 to 45 percent, with a higher genetic liability in those with earlier age at onset, and those, in fact, who have a more recurrent illness course. For bipolar disorder, the genetic liability is higher than major depression. Estimates vary between 60 to 75 percent, depending on the individual. We know that individuals who have a genetic liability to these conditions, major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder, have a alteration or have uh, changes in the genetic uh, uh, presentation, so-called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which bestow, bestow upon them a risk to these types of disorders. There's still, in fact, a active interest in trying to identify what are the gene sequences that are implicated as susceptibility or resiliency to major depression and bipolar, and as well, what are some of the epigenetic changes that lead to the illness of major depression and bipolar? I mentioned earlier the word effector systems or different types of physiologic systems that are implicated in risk and resiliency, and for six to seven decades, almost longer, we've had the monoamine paradigm insofar as disturbances in indolamines like serotonin or catecholamines are implicated as relevant to the pathophysiologic, certainly the treatment process. The last two to three decades, we've really expanded the, uh, if you will, the set of considerations that we are now implicating as relevant to pathophysiology. They would include the neurotrophic system like brain-derived neurotrophic factors, excitatory systems like glutamate, GABA imbalance or overexcitability, 
We also now talk more and more about neuroinflammation in major depression and bipolar disorder, not only as a cause, but as a comorbidity and perhaps even a, uh, 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 an important uh, target in individuals with these mood disorders. And finally, cellular bioenergetics. And we'll say a few more about, uh, about those areas in a few moments. I don't want to forget, however, to remind everybody that there's a lot of interest in epigenetics. We know that risk is modifiable. We know that genetic expression is modifiable, and so is protein translation. And there's a lot of interest in protein systems that participate in the epigenetic process. For example, one type of uh, protein system that's really, in fact, gathering a lot of interest these days is sirtuins. Sirtuins are involved in the process of cellular longevity and also cellular survival and integrity. And sirtuins are histone deacetylase inhibitors. And we do know, in fact, that in animal models of stress, as well as in preliminary data in mood disorders, there's a downregulation of sirtuin systems. Again, these systems are implicated in cellular longevity. And this is an interesting observation because there's a growing opinion, based on the evidence, that for many people, major depression and bipolar disorder represents a form of cellular aging or premature aging. We already know this in part because of some of the work with telomeres. Telomeres indicated to be shorter in people who have major depression or bipolar. Telomere is a biomarker of cellular age. So with that in mind, we can move forward and now talk about some of the other effector systems. I won't go through all of them in detail, uh, there's been a wealth of evidence now indicating that for about a third up to half of people with major depression or bipolar disorder, there's a disturbance in the immunoinflammatory system. Not only are there evidence indicating elevations of acute phase reactants like C-reactive peptide, but we also see alterations in other pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1 and 6, as well as anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10. Rather than conceptualizing depression or bipolar disorder as simply just increased inflammation, perhaps a more accurate, comprehensive, and coherent model would posit that there's a disturbance in the homeostatic network. That is an imbalance between the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory peptides. There's still, in fact, an effort to identify in vivo whether there's increase in inflammation in the human brain there certainly is evidence supporting that notion. For example, increased levels of cytokines have been observed in the CSF of individuals who have mood disorders. There's been post-mortem work done on human brain showing alterations in the expression of several of the inflammatory proteins. And there's been some very preliminary data looking at microglial activation, demonstrating that in the brain of people with mood disorders, major depression and bipolar disorder, there's an increase in the microglial activation. The microglia are the inflammatory cells within the central nervous system. The technology and the methodology around tagging with a radiopharmaceutical microglia is still a work in progress, and there's certainly been some questions raised about the interpretability of these types of studies. But that being said, we are in fact having at least a preliminary look at microglia in real live human be beings showing increase in activation. Now, I made a point of flagging the RDOC or the research domain criteria, and I've had a tremendous interest in the area of general cognition as well as reward. And we are beginning to believe that, yes, inflammation could be uh, playing a role in all or many of the domains of disturbance we see in major depression or bipolar where in fact the evidence is very compelling is in the area of general cognition, that is increased inflama inflammation may have a deleterious effect on cognition. Moreover, we know that inflammation has a greater likelihood of inducing anhedonia, reducing reward. And we hear this from patients in clinical practice and the evidence provides a very elegant model that increase in inflammatory markers, such as kynurinic acid, could in fact reduce the availability of dopamine in the reward circuit of the brain, that is the islands of Kalea in the striatum, for example, reducing the ability to experience pleasure. So there's a very powerful link between inflammation and general cognition with anhedonia and also social cognition. 
One of the paradigms of social cognition is a paradigm known as reading the uh, mind and the eyes test, where you can look at a set of pictures, facial pictures, and infer the individual's mood state or cognitive state or intention. And when subjects who are healthy are uh, have their immune system provoked through a paradigm, what is observed is that their social cognitive processes exhibit a decrease in performance. In other words, pro-inflammation not only adversely affects general cognition, it affects reward processes as well as social cognition. Moments ago, I had indicated that there's a relationship between inflammation and dopamine insofar as elevated inflam inflammatory markers are linked to increased turnover of dopamine. That, as a consequence, leaves the individual susceptible to not only mood changes, but also anhedonia, general cognitive changes. And it's a very interesting observation because it begins to, in fact, help us put the pieces together why people who experience depression are so often reporting problems with anhedonia, feeling apathetic, reduced cognitive abilities and cognitive dexterity, and in part, we think this is because of dopamine dysregulation. What we've also learned is, is that as inflammation increases in the brain, we begin to see an alteration of glutamate signaling. Glutamate is highly critical to normal and abnormal brain states. Glutamate is one of the most abundant, if not the most abundant, excitatory neurotransmitter. And there's evidence now in individuals with mood disorders, that is CRP, which is an acute phase reactant, is elevated in the periphery, we see alterations in glutamate signaling in the central compartment. So with all that together, where does that leave us? Well, we do know that monoamines play a role. There's a crosstalk with the inflammatory system. We know there's a lot of interest in glutamate GABA, as well as trophic systems like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, as well as, in fact, insulin growth factor and vascular growth factors. More recently, there's been a lot of interest now in looking at bioenergetics. Now, I mentioned sirtuins earlier. They're transcription proteins involved in cellular aging and longevity, and they're affected by stress and social isolation and are shown to be abnormal in people with depression. It also is the case that sirtuins are implicated in metabolism. So the brain, which represents about 5% about of the total human body weight, utilizes about 25% of total body energy. And we know that there are disturbances in the way cellular energy, in fact, is taking place in the human brain. And this, in fact, will be covered in one of our other modules where we speak to the role of insulin in changes in incretin systems in the brain and how that helps us understand not just brain function, but why patients who have mood disorders are so susceptible to metabolic disturbances like diabetes and obesity. So we start off with the genetic architecture. We move into a discussion of cellular integrity and molecules. I now want to change our discussion and now talk about circuits. It is true that in the human brain with individuals with major depression and bipolar, they exhibit a pattern that's commensurate with a disconnection syndrome. The brain is comprised of nodal structures, regional structures like the hippocampus, the cingulate, the striatum, thalamus, hypothalamus, and cortical structures at the prefrontal cortex. And these nodal structures are connected via circuits, and the circuits are connected via networks. One of the most well-known uh, circuits is called the task positive network, which is activated during a cognitive task, for example, doing serial sevens backwards. The default mode network is a task negative network, and that's activated during periods of a, at rest or just self-referential thinking or daydreaming, the so-called flow of consciousness. In addition to having circuits, the way the brain is architecturally and functionally constructed, we have, in fact, segregation of these circuits, but they're integrated. And their functional connectivity, which we refer to as reciprocity, is in fact connected. So when one circuit is in fact engaged, other circuits should be disengaged. That'd be a normal situation. In the brains of people who have major depression or bipolar disorder, what we see is the absence or the abnormality of the normal, what we call anti-correlation, where one circuit's activated and one is in fact deactivated. And this, we believe, helps us understand why patients experience 
decreased efficiency in cognitive functions. The, in, the decreased efficiency in cognitive functions can be observed in MRI and other types of imaging approaches. We literally can see in the human brain of people with mood disorders an effort of the brain to work harder to do the same task that someone who is not depressed, not bipolar, is in fact trying to uh, perform. So when you actually take individuals, for example, and you subject the brain to a stress test, what's the brain stress test? It's known as the NBAC test. So the NBAC test is a test of working memory. It really is the ability of the brain to hold multiple bits of information open at the same time. The way to think about it is like many folders on your computer open at the same time. And the NBAC is really asking the participant to in fact keep different information open and the stress test can be very severe, what we call three back or four back, or less strenuous, which we call the one back test. And when you subject people with depression to the NBAC test, which is the brain stress test, you really see the neural effort required. And what we see when we look at depressed people versus healthy controls is we see that people who are depressed need to engage more neural circuit to engage or to perform the same task when compared to healthy controls. In addition to actually working harder, that is the brain, to do the same task when compared to healthy controls, there is not the same degree of anti-correlation efficiency. So the brain's working harder and it's not as well in reciprocity, if you will, when compared to healthy controls. So when people who have major depression or bipolar complain about cognitive inefficiency and difficulties organizing their thoughts, in part, this may be explained by the abnormality in the reciprocity and the anti-correlation of circuits within the brain that subserve disparate phenomenological characteristics like cognitive function and emotional regulation. What's interesting is, is that we are now able to look at not just cognitive controlled networks, but also what's called hot cognition networks. These are the emotional networks in the human brain. When a person with depression, when compared to a healthy control person, is shown a, a stimuli that is negatively valenced, they're more likely to exhibit a significant reaction to that. And this exaggerated reaction is seen in nodal structures like the amygdala, and this manifest performatively or functionally when we look at the circuit-based approach that I described earlier. What's also really interesting to highlight is, is that not just the amygdala, but cortical structure, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is underactive in people with depression. We literally see the loss of effective top-down control in people who have major depression, that is top-down from the cortex down to the subcortical structures. How do antidepressants, psychotherapy, neuromodulation, maybe even aerobic exercise work? Well, still work in progress, but one of the hypotheses has been that we see a correction or improvement in the segregation, the integration, the reciprocity of the circuits. In other words, the anticorrelation is returned back to normal. In addition to that, in part of this process, we see a reduction in the exaggerated overactivity in emotional centers of the brain. And this normalization of brain reactivity as well as circuit function seems to correlate very well and even antedate or predate the onset of antidepressant action. So in conclusion, major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder are conditions of both development and degeneration. We do know that there is a progressive process that is occurring. It is indeed a confluence of genetic epigenetic and other units of analysis that are in fact abnormal in people who have this condition. Taken together, we believe that the phenomenology of mood disorders is subserved by disturbances in what I call CNN, circuits, nodes, and networks. And there's something abnormal about the structure, the function, the integration, the reciprocity of this circuit system. Treatments that we're developing and are currently available for mood disorders, among other things, have exhibited the ability to correct abnormal circuit function in individuals with mood disorders. In a subsequent module, we're going to discuss how the pathophysiology of mood disorders extends into the pathophysiology of comorbidity. Thank you for joining me for this program.